What was discovered atop this mountain in eastern Oklahoma was never meant to be found over 2,000 feet up and a virtual world away from where the story really begins. In Roxbury Township, New Jersey, where a girl named Jody Riley grew up in suburban bliss. What was it like raising Jody here? It's really an amazing town and close knit community for not a very small community. It's a, you know, 30,000 people. And he should know. Your husband, for much of the time that Jody was here, was the mayor of Roxbury? Mayor or council, but not, it, you know, but yes, he was the mayor at times. Yeah. So she grew up in a prominent family here. I, yeah, I guess you could say that, <laughs> yeah. But according to Jody's closest friends, the girl with a laugh described as contagious never acted like a daughter of privilege. Jody was so much fun. She had just the best energy. She celebrated your smallest victories and always there for you. Which is why Jody's loved ones say it came as such a blow when after high school, she seemed to want more than Roxbury could provide. What was your reaction when Jody said, I'm leaving and I'm going to Oklahoma? I was very upset because she was my closest friend. She had just gone through a bad breakup and she said, you know what, I need to just get away and breathe and, you know, she chose Oklahoma because she had family out there. She had been talking to my aunt for quite some time, and I think my aunt said, why don't you come out here and you can go to school out here for a little while. So at age 22, Jody left the bustle of suburbia behind for the relative wilds of Worcester, Oklahoma, population about a 1,000. She wanted a change of scenery. And what a change. Yes, <laughs> yes. Compared to Worcester, Roxbury may as well have been Manhattan, but despite the slower pace, Jody's life was changing at lightning speed. She goes to Oklahoma, and what happens? A couple months later, she had told me that she had met someone and that she seemed very happy. They were going on all these awesome dates. She was really into this person. His name was Donald Lebo Cephas Wilson, Bo for short. And that's all most of Jody's friends knew about him because before anyone got a chance to meet the new man in her life. We moved her to Oklahoma in December and she was announcing her wedding by that May. And that wasn't all. So when Jody told you that she was getting married. I thought it was just she was getting married. But. That she was pregnant. Did she express to you that she felt like she had to get married or she really wanted to get married? I think she wanted to. I really do. I, I don't think it was one where she felt she, she must be married. It was something she wanted, to be married, have a child. I think she looked forward to that. So I think it was kind of a dream come true. Here she is just a few months after that big announcement, a clearly beaming bride with a groom to match. I was her maid of honor. The wedding was beautiful. She was the most beautiful bride. But in other pictures from that day, one can't help but notice the differences between the first family of Roxbury and the Wilsons of Worcester. It was definitely like two worlds colliding, but everybody got along and it was a beautiful day. And roughly four months after that beautiful day, Jody gave birth to a beautiful baby girl named Annabelle. Jody was the best mom. She just fell right into it, she was a natural. A new husband, a new baby, everything seemed to be falling right into place. But was it all happening too fast? And were all these rapid changes as happy as they appeared? She confided that she was having some trouble in her marriage, struggling a little bit with balancing a lot of his family's opinions about the baby. I know she felt like her toes were being stepped on a little bit. And there was something else, a secret Lisa says she's been harboring since a few days before the wedding when Jody took her to a local bar to meet some of her friends. We had only been there for a few minutes when somebody had come in the door and thrown a set of car keys and it hit Jody in the back of the head. I kind of stood up out of my seat not knowing what was going on and one of her friends just grabbed my arm and said, don't get involved, that's Bo. 
Lisa says Jody told her to forget about it and even swore her to secrecy. She begged me not to say anything and ruin her wedding day. She was determined to make things work with Bo and have Annabelle born into a loving home. Now Lisa often finds herself wondering what might have happened if she had said something. I'm sorry. It's emotional. Those tears stem from one very dark Tuesday in May. Jody had just finished making a round of calls to let her loved ones know she lost her phone and that she'd be going away for a few days. The last time I communicated with Jody was on Tuesday. She didn't have her phone, so she had to go through using her husband's phone. And she was telling me they were going to be going to New Mexico for a funeral. When did Jody tell you that she was leaving for the funeral? Thursday. And the last time you talked to her was? Tuesday evening. The next day, Stacy sent her daughter an email. And in the two days to follow, several more. I just was not getting any response. So I called to find out what was, you know, going on. Who'd you call? Her husband. He tells Stacy that the family actually left for the funeral that Tuesday night instead of Thursday, but that Jody suddenly opted to stay behind for work and then this. The rest of the family took Annabelle to go to the funeral. The girl was just three and a half months old. And when you heard that, did that seem odd? Yes, she would not let them take the baby and her stay behind. And there was more bad news, as reported by journalist Abbott Koloff, who was about to become part of the story in a very big way. The Wilsons drove home on Saturday. Jody wasn't home, their dogs weren't fed and there was a box outside and it was soaked in the rain. Inside that rain-soaked box? My wife uh, sent a locket that said mom on it uh, for Jody for first Mother's Day. I think right then and there, that's when we were like, yeah, something's not right here. So much can happen in a year. Lives can merge, lives can be created, lives can disappear. Such was the case for 23-year-old Jody Riley Wilson, missing from her Worcester, Oklahoma home after husband Bo, mother-in-law Kathy, and father-in-law Jerry left for an out-of-state funeral, one Jody was supposed to attend. So when you finally spoke to your son-in-law, mm -hmm. he was coming back from the funeral, and that's the first time you heard that Jody hadn't gone. Correct. And he's like, well, I'm on my way back. As soon as I get back, I'll let you know what I, you know, what's going on. From that point on, it was, she was missing. When the Wilsons reportedly return home that Saturday, they find the dog unattended and packages left out in the rain. Bo files a missing persons report. And from over 1,300 miles away in New Jersey, so do the Rileys. At what point do you make the decision that I've got to get to Oklahoma and figure out what's going on here? Sunday, I flew to Oklahoma, and I drove directly to the Worcester Police Department. James is met at the station by Bo, and while the two wait for information there, elsewhere, Jody's friends hope for the best. I just kept saying she's going to show up, and that Sunday was Mother's Day, and it was... It was her first Mother's Day, and Jody and her mom were, were so close that I just felt myself watching the clock all day. What no one knew then, not the Rileys nor the Wilsons, was that just two days earlier, a paraglider flying over a mountain 15 miles from Jody's home was getting a bird's eye view of horror. That was Mother's Day weekend that we found out that you found out what? We found out that a body was found uh, up on uh, a mountain. The body had been wrapped in trash bags, dumped like garbage. When the OSBI agent came, he immediately uh, told both Bo and I that uh, a body had been found and had been identified as my daughter. Take a second.
were you the one to break it to your wife? Um, yeah. I had to call my wife and tell her. And on of all days. That was um, devastating. The darkest day ever. Ever. And Mother's Day has never been the same since. But while dental records confirmed it was definitely Jody found on that mountain, because of her advanced state of decomposition, authorities couldn't determine exactly how she died. Only that the trash bags concealing her, as well as drag marks in the grass around her body, made her death suspicious. She was brought to a place where she was not to be found. There's zero question about that. And it's not like she went for a walk and slip and, and fell, right? I mean, there's... This isn't a place you would go for a walk. It was literally on top of the mountain uh, at the end of a dirt road and dragged into the woods. It is unbelievable, isn't it, that a paraglider saw her? It's a miracle because having to live without knowing is, is pretty bad, too. And there was someone else who found the whole story pretty extraordinary, New Jersey reporter Abbott Koloff. So when you first heard about it, how was the story? What, what were the headlines at the time? Well, it was that um, Roxbury mayor's daughter was missing and then found uh, on top of a mountain, and it was a suspicious death. The belief is that she was murdered. Well, the belief is that she was, prop that there, was, there must have been a reason to cover something up. Mm -hmm. whether she was murdered or not. And Koloff says the more he dug around, the more suspicious the story became. She was going to a funeral on Thursday, and that raised all kinds of questions because uh, the family left Tuesday, not Thursday. So why did the family suddenly leave on Tuesday night? Why did the family go without her and with the baby? Good questions, and as part of his reporting, Koloff asked them. They didn't exactly explain it. I've talked to family members, and they were just told, oh, Jody changed her mind. But those weren't even the only issues raising eyebrows. Reports from friends say that before she died, Jody had been feeling homesick and may have even been planning a trip back to New Jersey with Annabelle. Which she said it was too quiet out there. It was very quiet for her. This homesickness, did this become more of an issue between her and Bo? I don't know. But Jody's friend Lisa says it was an issue, one of many between Bo and Jody. We had spoken about her coming back to New Jersey quite a bit. Ever since the first time I met Bo, you know, I had been trying to reassure her that she could always come home. She just wasn't sure how to go about it and what her rights would be and things like that. Police do question Bo and the rest of the family about the rumors and suspicions, but no charges are ever filed. Even after investigators find Jody's car a month later, over 100 miles away from her body. Where was Jody's vehicle? It was uh, sitting in a parking lot for weeks at a place called the Pig Out Palace. The keys were in the ignition and the door was unlocked. What authorities found in that car has never been revealed to the public. But for the next eight years, no arrests were ever made, no major breaks at all. It's over 3,000 days. It's a long time. Then, for the eighth anniversary of Jody's death, Abbott Koloff decided to revisit the case. It was um, a very sad story. And I went to my editors this year and said, I'd like to come back to this because I didn't want Jody to be forgotten in Oklahoma, where she had lived. And as the reporter started digging back in, he found that a lot has changed since Jody's suspicious death. Bo Wilson is now a preacher. I know he's remarried. Uh, he's living in another town. Last time I called him was uh, for the series that I, we did in May. And I told him who I was, and I wanted to speak about Jody. And um, he said, OK, and then hung up. And then he changed his number. So that's the extent of our relationship. As for Bo's parents, Kathy and Jerry. Jerry is an interesting person. He had a couple of run-ins with the law. In 2013, he uh, took out a knife and threatened someone at a restaurant in Worcester. He got a suspended sentence for that. And he got even worse from wife Kathy. His wife threw him out of their house. 
in court papers, she said that he threatened to kill her with a knife. And then he was ordered out of the home, according to court papers, on May 2nd of this year. Three days after that incident, Koloff's updated report on Jody is published online. And a few months after that, just days before we sat down to conduct our interviews, Abbott Koloff got a very interesting call from someone claiming to have new information. That caller, Bo's dad, Jerry Wilson. Let me tell you, let me tell you what happened. She moved from New Jersey to Oklahoma for a change of scenery and wound up dead on the top of a mountain. But even though Jody Riley Wilson was found dragged through the dirt and wrapped in trash bags, for eight years, police could only call her death suspicious. No suspects named. It's been eight years. Mm -hmm. My guess is you've got to be a little frustrated. Yes. Uh, it's, it's been a roller coaster of emotions for us. We're hoping somebody steps up and says, you know, this is what happened. And someone was about to. Earlier this year, after publishing a series of articles for the anniversary of Jody's unsolved death, New Jersey reporter Abbott Koloff reached out to various family members for comment, including Jody's father-in-law, Jerry Wilson. I left a message saying who I was, and they just written the, the story about Jody. And then I just said, I want you to talk about that night. And he called me back. Do you mind if I record you? No, no, not at all. Let me tell you, let me tell you what happened. It was just days before our own reporting began. Now, it's, it's hard to tell this because, but it's the truth. On this particular night, my wife and Bo had left the house, and I was there taking care of the three-month-old baby. You were watching the baby at your house? Yes, sir. So do you remember why the baby was at your house? Yeah, they, they had to go somewhere for a few minutes. Okay. And they were gone about four or five hours. Questionable enough as is, but it's what Jerry says Kathy did when she came back that really got his attention. She went in the, in the closet and started digging around. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm fixing to haul off this body. Jerry dropped a bomb. He certainly did, uh, several of them. So at the time, on May 5th, your wife comes in and out. Did you leave for the funeral that night? Yeah, as soon as they got back, we did. I don't know what time it was. It was sometimes during the night. And two days before, when Jody told everyone they were leaving. So they rushed out on Tuesday night. He said that Kathy said, we got to go, we got to go get on the road. And after that, he says they left with their bags, with baby Annabelle, and even with Kathy's pet possum, but no Jody. It was probably midnight or after. And there was something else about that trip. Jerry says that initially his son Bo took a separate car, Jody's car. And uh, Bo took her car. It's the Pig Out Palace, but the name of the town is Henrietta. They parked her car right on the side. And then I asked him, I said, what's Jody's car doing up here? And he said, oh, she'll be up here in the morning to pick you up. After that, Jerry says Bo got into their car and they all drove on to that funeral in New Mexico. So when you found out that she had died, had you ever asked Bo about it? Yeah, Bo was this quiet mouth. He, I don't know, I don't know, but I should have known he was lying to me. It was only after a few years of casual questioning that Jerry says his son finally broke down and told him exactly what happened. He'd been planning on killing her for several days or weeks before this happened. She was wanting to take the baby and go back to New Jersey to see her mother and dad, and he didn't want her to go. He said, yeah, I put a bag over her head and I smothered her to death, and then uh, we put her up on the mountain. We, as in Bo and his mom, Kathy. So he put the bag over her head. Yeah. Now, I don't know where my wife was involved in that part of it or not, but she was with him. They were throw that girl in the back of her car and hold her up in the mountains and throw her out. In the back of uh, which car? Kathy's car? No, Jody's car. And this was because she was going to take the baby. Well, she was talking about going home for good, right? No, she was just going to take the baby and go visit her mom and dad for a few days. So he killed her because she uh, was going to just go for a few days? Yeah. Why didn't he want Jody to he go see her parents? 
He was afraid that she wouldn't come back. It was all right there in Jerry's statement. A family of suspects and a timeline for murder complete with motive. It's such an incredible allegation. Basically, you have the father claiming that the son has committed murder. Right. Did your jaw just drop when he said that? It was a very chilling moment. But if Jerry had this information for so many years, why did he wait so long to come forward? And why so soon after getting kicked out of the house by his wife, Kathy? A man scorned. He is obviously um, angry about what happened. Is he telling the whole truth? I can't say. I, I don't know. But then Abbott Koloff wasn't the only person Jerry had spoken to. Months before he made that recorded call, on the exact same day he was removed from his home with Kathy, Jerry went to the police with the same basic story. That Kathy uh, and with, talked about having to get rid of a body and that Bo had put a bag over Jody's head and smothered her. But that statement was made over three months before we sat down for this report. So why hadn't there been any arrests? They say little Annabelle is growing up to look just like her mom, Jody Riley Wilson. When you look into your granddaughter's eyes, I see my daughter. I have to do a double take sometimes. You know, it means a lot to me to have her in my, our lives. She's a little bit of Jody. Yes. Sadly, Annabelle was just three and a half months old when her mother lost her life. And if the recent statements by Jody's father-in-law are to be believed, Jody's husband, Bo, and mother-in-law Kathy are responsible. So Jody's own father-in-law is making an incredible accusation. He says that Jody's husband, Bo, put a bag over her head and suffocated her. This news has just broken. How do you react to this? I'm shocked. I haven't really had time to process it. It's a little strange that now he's coming and he's saying this. Why not eight years ago after it happened? It's a fair question, especially given the timing of when Jerry finally did go to the police, the very day Kathy had him kicked out of the house. Now, that cannot be coincidence. Probably not. The day he gets kicked out of the house is the day he starts singing about his wife and his son murdering right. his daughter-in-law? That's the day that they said they talked to him. Either way, there is one indisputable fact when it comes to Jerry. He is the first to speak publicly. He's the only one breaking his silence. I'd like to hear what Bo has to say about that night and what Kathy has to say about that night. And so would a lot of other people. So we decided to ask the Wilsons ourselves. So we've been on a stakeout for days here in Oklahoma looking for Bo and his mother, Kathy. Right now, we're outside of Kathy's house. That's Bo's mother, Jody's mother-in-law. And then, as we sat waiting, go. Let's go. Hey, Bo. Bo. Hey, can we talk to you, please? Bo, we want to talk to you about Jody and what happened. Your father, your father's making some serious accusations. Your father is saying you killed your wife and says that your mother helped. Do you have anything to say? You got anything to say? Very loud silence from Bo. Then the door opened again. It was Kathy. Kathy? Yeah. No comment. But, but Kathy, your ex-husband has made some serious allegations. You helped dispose of Jody's body. Which uh, radio station are you from? No, we're from Crime Watch Daily. Do you think maybe Jerry's just mad at you because you tossed him out of the house and it's just revenge? No answer from mom either. But as we were about to find out, there may have been one very good reason the two weren't talking. Turns out, just one week before this encounter, a warrant was issued for DNA swabs of both Bo and Kathy, quote, pertaining to the homicide of Jody Riley Wilson. In the affidavit, they said they were looking to for a comparison to evidence found in the car. So what that evidence is, we don't know. So clearly the authorities are taking Jerry's claims seriously. Uh, enough to go to a judge with it, yes. 
Then, just nine days after we showed up at Bo and Kathy's doorstep... We wanted to uh, announce that uh, two arrest warrants have been issued, one for Donald Lee Bocephus Wilson, one for Edith Catherine Wilson. Uh, these are two suspects in the murder of Jody Riley Wilson. Eight long years after a paraglider spotted Jody's body on the top of a mountain, her ex-husband, Bo Wilson, and mother-in-law, Kathy, are under arrest, charged with first-degree murder and accessory after the fact, respectively. The penalty for murder in the first degree in this particular case carries either life or life without parole. Uh, the penalty for accessory after the fact carries up to 45 years. We caught up with Jody's dad via Skype just days ago to get his reaction on the latest. Well, you know, right now, uh, Stacy and I are spending 100% of our time making sure Annabelle feels uh, loved and safe, and um, we'll wait for the uh, case to be adjudicated in Oklahoma. And until that day comes, James says he won't be commenting on how the family feels about just who was arrested, only the latest developments with their granddaughter, who up until recently was staying with her father in Oklahoma. When we were in Oklahoma, um, uh, DHS met with us and we were given temporary guardianship. And uh, since then, there's been a second case which granted us a permanent guardianship. The little girl now being raised in the same house as her mother before her. Hopefully, uh, Annabelle. She seems to be enjoying it herself right now, being with us, and um, we'll deal with the. Th Sorry, and we'll work to make uh, Annabelle's uh, life as comfortable and happy as possible. And like I said, show her all the love in the world, like they did with Jody. What a sad, sad story. It is a sad story, and hopefully, um, it'll draw to some conclusion that the Rileys at least will be able to know what happened to their daughter. And right now, they're in a state of limbo. Uh, and have been for years, just not knowing. I mean, had her body not been found, they wouldn't even know that she's dead. When do you miss your daughter the most? Every day. Every day. Every day I talk to her and I tell her how much I miss her. <laughs> I really miss her a lot. <laughs> I tell her that every single day. It's a very different case now than it was when we started investigating, developing as rapidly as the changes in Jody's last year of life. But for the family, there is one thing that has remained consistent since the day their daughter died, and will until the judge's gavel comes down. I just want justice for my daughter is basically, you know, how I feel. I just want somebody to right the wrong that happened in her life. A daughter is not going to have that opportunity to have her mother in her life, and it's very hard on us, and uh, I hope this case gets solved because it's, it's something that's overdue.